This is a News Laundry podcast and you're listening to NL Hafta. Angrez apna lagan aur News Laundry apna hafta kabhi nahi chhodte. Welcome to another episode of Hafta. We are recording this on Zoom from the comfort of our homes as we have some covid cases in office we had in fact we before last so we're giving it a two week break and manisha has gone on leave on the panel today is our very own anand who will have lots to tell us about bihar hi anand hello yes anand so bihar excitement done i hope you have lots to share with us yes a few things yes great uh, also joining us from chennai is jeshri hi jeshri hi everyone and joining us also on the phone line is joanna slater hi joanna Hello. So Joanna is the India bureau chief of the Washington Post. She's an award-winning foreign correspondent. Her career includes reporting assignments in the US, Europe and Asia and before the post she worked at Canada's Globe and Mail and the Wall Street Journal. She was based in Asia for 7 years, first in Hong Kong and then in Mumbai. In 2014-15 she was posted in Berlin where she covered Europe's refugee crisis and Joanna began her career as a loose scholar. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yes, it is. at the far east economic review and was also a night bagge hot fellow is that right if they say badget 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 at the columbia university oh great so welcome joanna how has uh, india been treating you so far oh uh, wonderfully uh, until the pandemic i think everyone uh, feels the same way and ha- have you got acclimatized to the delhi air it's like everest you know the oxygen level <laughs> aren't <laughs> very <laughs> Yeah, it's uh it's I have to say it's 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 always pretty grim this time of year and the striking thing is how quickly you forget it. You know, you know spring summer rolls around and you forget just how bad it gets in the fall. You've been in Delhi how long now? Since 2018, almost 3 years. Right. So you and Anand have lots to tell us uh because of the election in your country and Anand state but before that uh, let's get the headlines from Jayashree but before that even i would just like to thank all our subscribers and contributors for the NL Sena project where our wonderful reporter reported from Bihar for about a month and uh, we pretty much topped up all that we required to do this report so thank you all we hope you like the reports we hope the editorial team did justice to your expectations uh, i think we are just a little bit short so we're going to keep that up for another day in the nl sena project so if you could just stop it up you that would be great because as you know we don't depend on advertisers and we depend on subscribers because when the public pays the public is served and advertisers pay advertisers are served and also we have a legal fund up because in true bullying style we did a report on the sakal times which is run by the pawar family and they have taken us to court and uh, uh, criminal complaint has been filed against our reporter pratik uh, in pune so we have that up as well uh, there are significant legal expenses and like we don't depend on advertisers we are new so we hope you can top that up so we can get good legal representation to make sure we can continue to report freely fairly and we are unafraid so uh, jeshri uh, can we have the headlines please and then we'll get straight into the discussion we we'll started american yeah, ndr sure. so the nda gets majority in bihar and is set to form government while the rjd emerged as the largest party the nda won 125 out of 243 seats while the rjd registered a victory on 75 seats uh, mm-hmm. joe biden has won the us presidential election trump hasn't conceded though biden's transition process is now stalled Biden's victory came after the Associated Press, CNN and NBC showed him winning Pennsylvania and gaining more than the 270 electoral college votes needed to secure the presidency. Trump sought to undermine the outcome, baselessly accusing Democrats of trying to steal the election and claiming victory before the race was called. Arnab Goswami's bail plea has finally been granted by the Supreme Court after it was rejected by the Bombay High Court. While granting him interim bail, the Supreme Court also expressed displeasure on the Bombay High Court ruling. saying high courts are not doing enough in matters where personal liberty is denied and that if a constitutional court does not interfere court we are traveling on the path of destruction undeniably we have a couple of other republic headlines as well uh, the delhi high court on monday issued notices to republic tv and times now on a plea filed by top bollywood filmmakers and producers that seeks to restrain the channels from making or publishing allegedly irresponsible derogatory and defamatory remarks against the film industry the court also asked the channels to ensure that defamatory content is not displayed on their channels or on their social media platforms 
The Republic TV's distribution head was arrested in Mumbai in a fake ratings case. Kanshyam Singh, who heads the channel's distribution, is the 12th accused to be taken in by the Mumbai police in connection with the TRP case. Uh, the government has issued an order bringing online news portals and content providers such as Netflix under the IND ministry. Unsurprisingly, that will also include us. Yes, the order noted that it was amending the Government of India allocation of business rules, so it will now include films and audiovisual programs made available by online content providers, as well as news and current affairs content. So in some good news, Pfizer's early data shows that its vaccine is more than 90% effective. It didn't release a lot of details from its clinical trial, but it's based on the first formal review of data by an outside panel of experts. And it said no serious safety concerns have been observed. A 29-year-old reporter was hacked to death near Chennai. He used to cover illegal land sales and ganja sales. And he was hacked by three people with machetes. His name was G. Moses, and he allegedly approached the police before his death, saying that he needed protection. Tanishk has taken down yet another ad, this one for Diwali. The ad had promoted cracker-free Diwali and received a social media backlash. I think so Tanishk make, makes ads to take them down. I think that's their fault. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's getting a lot of traction this way. Yes. So next up, WhatsApp payment service goes live in India after about two years of waiting. Uh, the expansion of WhatsApp's UPI user base will happen in a graded manner, starting with a maximum registered user base of 20 million. There's a total ban on crackers from midnight to November 30th in Delhi and nearby areas. So that's good news for you guys in Delhi. The well, ban... I don't know about that because uh, Mr. Khattar in Haryana has allowed it for two hours and that will not stay to two hours. And if Gurgaon... yeah, I'd, be I'd be impressed to see how well they implement it. So this was passed by the National Green Tribunal, which is a total ban on sale and use of firecrackers. Uh, the Editors Guild has written a letter to Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister talking about press freedom and asking for the withdrawal of cases against working journalists in the state. Uh, the UAE has decriminalized alcohol and lifted its ban on an unmarried couples living together. It's also said that foreigners living in the Gulf state can follow their home country laws on things like divorce and inheritance. Um, an LSR student has died by suicide in Telangana. She was a second year student of mathematics and had purportedly cited financial troubles in a suicide note. Her father said that she was unable to even buy a second-hand laptop to pursue her online classes during the pandemic. And yeah, that's it. So in fact, this case is um, telling of many other cases where um, scholarships are either delayed or just haven't landed up at all. So um, yeah, I think a larger story is due on this. Just want to thank everybody for the inputs we've got on the new website. Keep them coming. Wherever you're facing a glitch, many of those have been solved by now. Um, by the time this is up, it should have been solved on most browsers and most uh, areas because we were getting some complaints from Australia and stuff. So do give us your feedback and I hope you're enjoying the new website experience. Once we have the login process completely smooth so that you don't have to do a separate login for the podcast player, then we will pull Hafta behind the paywall. But until then, it's free. I think that may take another week or two. Secondly, we have started this new system where we collect all the letters and read them at the end rather than read them in the middle. Because some of you wanted the letters to be read. Some of you said they take too long. Please don't read them. So what we have done is we have just got them together and read them all together at the end. And because now our podcast player allows you to skip to whatever subject you want. If you want to skip the letters, you can skip the letters. So that's a good compromise, I thought. But uh, let's start with our um, guest's country, uh, the US election. So, uh, Joanna, uh, I was watching... Of CNN, which is, I guess, also uh, heavily anti-Trump. The at least what I'm getting is that there is no possibility of any legal recourse. I mean, there's an inevitability to it. Is that accurate? Has have most legal experts agreed on that? And if that is an impossibility, that that will stall the proceedings. And what is all this about? <laughs> Well, I, I will not presume uh, to speak for the Trump administration or their legal strategy, but yes, there does not seem to be at the moment a legal route toward the contesting these results. I mean, uh, you know, it, it is possible in theory to have a lawsuit that challenges certain ballots, but in order to change the result, that lawsuit would have to involve a number of ballots big enough to change the results. And, and there's been absolutely, not only have 
Uh, Trump's lawyer has been unsuccessful with their legal um, strategy so far, but there's no sign whatsoever of any irregularities that would be large enough to change this result. So, I mean, there's there really does not seem to be any legal path forward, but that has not uh, prevented uh, the president and and some of his you know senior officials from declining to acknowledge that reality. But there were two headlines uh, that I saw today. One was about. Uh, a Republican lawmaker, I forget his name, uh, you may be more familiar with it, who has mm-hmm. said that if by Friday mm-hmm. uh, Trump's administration doesn't trigger the you know handover because mm-hmm. the Secretary of State is not giving access to the information mm-hmm. that uh, the incoming president should get, uh, that uh, he will intervene. Uh, I don't know what that means or what he can do. And the second headline I read was that another Republican has uh, put out an award of, I, I think, $100,000 or a million dollars for anyone who gives evidence of voter fraud. So, <laughs> I don't understand. So you first go to court with a case and then say, I have no evidence, but you ask for the evidence as this award. I mean, is right. that legal? And, and in the second case, who is this Republican? Is he uh, influential enough to to intervene if, if the handover doesn't happen? I'll just try to pull out his uh, his name. Yeah, I think... I think I saw. I think I saw that report. I mean, I think uh, I, I don't really think no. I, I don't think he has the ability to, you know, intervene in a broad sense. Uh, he may have the ability to intervene in so far as I believe he's on um, uh, a Homeland Security or Intelligence Committee. I'm not sure which one it is. I apologize, but I think he could intervene to the extent that he could perhaps start sharing, start facilitating the sharing of information from his committee. But in terms of uh, starting the broader transition process, he doesn't have anything to to do to do with that. I mean, as for the as for the reward, uh, I haven't seen that report. Uh, it, it is in theory legal. I don't think it's a particularly. Um, I don't think it's going to buy you a lot of credibility with judges if that's how you're. Um, you're going out collecting evidence. evidence. <laughs> right. Exactly. So so no. I mean, what you have at the moment is you have you have the president refusing to concede and members of his administration refusing to acknowledge the result, but at the same time acknowledging Senate races uh, that were decided in the exact same <laughs> process. Right. Uh, so it's it's a little awkward at the moment. And if you could just explain, what does it mean to win the White House, control the Senate, and the mm-hmm. House? Uh, mm-hmm. it, because there is some speculation that if Biden doesn't win, is that this get the majority in the Senate? I mean, they, they can kind of pretty much uh, block any administration yes. significant. Yes. So, so yeah. could you explain that structure? Sure, sure. So, um, so in the U.S., the it's a it's a bicameral legislature, uh, kind of like India, except both houses are directly elected. So the Democrats control uh, the House of Representatives, but as of now. They, the Senate is kind of on a razor's edge. They, they do not control the Senate. And without the Senate's consent, it's very difficult to pass uh, significant uh, legislation. You need both the House and the Senate's consent to pass laws, uh, and of course the President's signature as well. So it would depend if it ends up, and there are, it looks like they're gonna be, <laughs> this election is not entirely over. Looks like uh, there are gonna be uh, two more elections for the Senate in Georgia because the, re- the result was so close there. Uh, but uh, it does seem uh, as though it depends on on whether a Republican-led Senate is totally obstructionist and refuses to um, help uh, the president elect or the president when he is inaugurated. Could I just ask, like, is there a precedent for this where uh, a going president has refused to concede and has taken legal me- legal measures and so on. Not not in this respect. So the closest thing that we have to something like this is in is in 2000, but that's very very different. So I think that's actually worth talking about. So what happened in 2000 is that the election actually hinged on the state of Florida. So whoever right. won the state of Florida would win the election. And then you had a result in Florida that was extremely, extremely close. So all the votes were counted and the margin of victory was very small. So then they started a recount and the court case that eventually went to the Supreme Court was about whether that recount should be allowed to continue. And what the Supreme Court did in the end was said that the recount, it stopped the recount and that decided the election in the end, ultimately in favor of George W. Bush. So 
there's nothing remotely like that here. <laughs> and in fact, at that time, apparently Florida law doesn't have a provision for a machine recount. And there was this case of hanging chads, right? Right, the, the hanging chads, the hanging chads. So, okay, so this is new. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how uh, the other countries would be gloating. And if I was listening to the BBC podcast. <laughs> uh, nations, uh, leaders and politicians have said that so much are teaching us about democracy. Mm. <laughs> that's, uh, I guess that's given everybody a little thing to chuckle about. But let me just get Jayashree and Anand's views. Have you guys been consuming any uh, you know, US media? I have a few more questions for Joanna regarding the coverage. But if uh, you have any observations on what you've seen and uh, what you think. I mean, I would say that this was fully expected of Trump. I mean, to not honor an election. And it started off very, very early in counting as well. So maybe the only situation where he might have gone gracefully would perhaps if there had been a landslide. But this wasn't, this was not close, but it wasn't a close enough election that it could be called a landslide. I mean, and short of him carrying out a full-on coup, I think he's going to have to go at some point kicking and screaming. This is just sort of dragging out the inevitable. So, yeah, but I'm intrigued to know about how this transition will be affected because I understand it's access to agencies and like even something as basic as uh, Biden's personnel getting security clearance, right? So at what point do they need that? Do they need the transition aid to be able to go ahead? Right. Anand, you have a few as well? No, I think your question is about media coverage. So my consumption of the news regarding U.S. elections has been restricted to some newspaper reports. So I cannot comment on the whole range of media coverage. I have not followed it through television. So what, what have you been following it through? What, what, I've, what is your source and what do you get from the sources that you consume? No, uh, uh, as Jeff pointed out, it it was since it was a close for landslide, and the fact that Mr. Trump got 48 percent of the popular vote. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the split in the political America, political U.S. is quite evident, and uh, this will have bearing in uh, on the next four years of uh, Biden regime. Uh, no doubt it will. But Joanna, you know, a few things, uh, observations. I mean, I do a lot of consumption of, of news from Desi channels, Desi platforms, Desi papers, and also uh, the US press and channels. Uh, one thing was, of course, one of my favorite podcasters who is not very popular among a lot of people is Bill Ma. He's been warning of this for the last three years. And in fact, he asked Bernie this when he was. He says, he's not going to go. What are you going to do? I didn't have a plan. In fact, last weekend, he said, I have been asking every Democrat who came to my show for the last three years. This is what he's going to do. What's your plan if he doesn't, if he refuses to go? They didn't have a plan. So he was rather dismissive of them on that. But, you know, uh, I, uh, when it comes to a landslide, this data point that I just got today, last, last presidential election, Trump's margin of victory in Georgia, um, I think Arizona, and uh, other than Pennsylvania, the, the third state, which is also not called yet, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, which are the ones that are due? Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona? Uh, Arizona, yeah. And there's one more, right? Or there's, there's uh, no, I think, I mean, Michigan and Wisconsin are, Michigan. So are, are finished. Right? Trump's margin of victory was narrower when he won than Biden's margin of victory is right now. Uh, I mean, I think uh, certainly in, um, in, Arizona. In, in Michigan, in Michigan, Biden's uh, margin of victory is bigger. In Wisconsin, it's basically the same. In Pennsylvania, as of now, it's a, a little bit smaller. But of course, I mean, Trump won Georgia by a pretty big margin, and now he lost it. Uh, and you know, likewise, Arizona. Well, so, what is the landslide? I mean, if, if uh, I mean, is the expectation yeah. that it's going to be like a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, a million vote difference? Like when it comes to U.S. elections, like for example, Bihar, one can say this time, and we'll come to Bihar. And I just like to have your observations of when you cover elections like this as an international correspondent. What do you look at? What are the kind of stories you look mm -hmm. at? But, um, you know, uh, in Bihar this time, like, you know, people like Paswan, of course, that was the Lok Sabha election. They had world records of how much they won. This time, they were just such narrow margins because one is used to larger margins in, you know, many elections here. What is a large margin in the US? 
Um, are these wafer thin margins? Are these no, these are these are definitely not wafer thin margins. I mean, I guess again, this is all a question of 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 expectation, uh, right? And I guess you have to decide how you're going to measure it. I mean, are you going to measure it in the U.S. by the popular vote percentage? Are you going to measure it by the number of total votes? Are you going to measure it by the electoral college? So, you know, I mean, already, already, um, you know, Biden is ahead of George W. Bush's two electoral college wins. I don't know if we were talking about, I mean, we talked about how close uh, George W. Bush's uh, win was in 2000, but in 2004, I mean, no Republican has, there's only one Republican that has won the popular vote in the United States in a presidential election since 1992. And that's George W. Bush once, once. So, so I think, you know, I wanted to come back to what you were saying before about lessons in democracy. And I think what we keep seeing over and over again in uh, these U.S. presidential elections uh, is, is the kind of anachronistic nature of the Electoral College, which really, you know, makes everyone, gets everyone, you know, focused on, you know, 20,000 votes in Wisconsin when, you know, George, uh, when Joe Biden has like four or five million more votes than Donald Trump at the national level. So. And how inappropriate is Mike Pompey saying that we'll see a smooth transition to a smooth <laughs> I mean, is, is that to be you taken? Know, I think it's, I mean, obviously, uh, I, I think it's, I found it at first when I saw that, I found it difficult to kind of understand uh, what exactly was, was going on there. I have seen someone suggest that it's because Pompeo himself wants to run for president uh, four years from now and therefore wants to be seen as, you know, a good supporter of, 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 you know, Trump and therefore win, you know, later on down the line win kind of loyalty, Trump's loyalty and the loyalty of his supporters. That's honestly that that's the only explanation that makes sense. I don't know why a Secretary of State would say that at this point in time. Uh, in case uh, some of our listeners are wondering what you're talking about, he during a press conference when he was asked about a smooth transition because the Trump administration is not aligned with smooth transition, he says there will be a smooth transition to another Trump administration. That's the context. Also wanted to Quickly remind you of our Diwali Se Christmas Tuck offer of lovely NL merch. We have some really fantastic gifts. So if you have Diwali gifts or Christmas gifts to give, what better gift to give than the News Laundry merch, which is great value, I must tell you. It's great quality. But it also supports independent journalism. So thank you for that. And please contribute to our legal fund. That case of Sakal Times is going to go into another few hearings. And now the latest they have you know, uh, sent summons for Raman, sir. So we shall fight it out in court, but we shall not back off and shall continue to report. But for that, we need the resources. So check out our legal fund and do contribute so that we can continue to do our work unafraid. So uh, now if you just stay on, uh, you know, for another 20, 25 minutes, Joanna, we'd be great to like you one what's happening in the, you know, media space here. Uh, but Anand, the Bihar, uh, of course, again, trumped all pollsters, uh, pretty much everyone, except I think uh, the Times now, whoever they had uh, employed, they kind of got it right, but everybody else got it wrong. And, you know, I think you had mentioned that these smaller parties, I mean, you were not very impressed with them, but all these VIP parties, they've not done badly, have they? No, these parties, these parties were part of uh, two parties, VIP party. And hum, that is Hindustani Awam uh, Mocha. So they were part of NDA, and they have not done well. Uh, they have not done badly. They both have uh, secured four seats right. each, so eight seats, and uh, in a scenario like the present, those are valuable seats. But you would, but you don't think they are significant by themselves. I think uh, both uh, like uh, both uh, of them are leaders of constituencies with. Uh, which uh, Mr. Nistish Kumar uh, co created in, uh, in his 15 years of chief ministership, that is the social coalition of extremely backward classes. Uh, and uh, um, like uh, Mr. Mukesh Shani is a leader of the Malla, Malla uh, caste, which is a, a caste within OBC, but extremely backward. Now he promoted those caste leaders. So he is very much in alignment with these leaders. And, and then Mahadalit leader, Mr. Manji, now within Dalit community also, there are some 
extremely backward castes within that larger group and, and that is all mahadalits ecbs are natural social constituencies of mr kumar so and these leaders have emerged from those caste groups so he is in political alignment with these two leaders so he would not, they would not be a threat to mr kumar but, uh, um is so is this whole thing because these parties are very specifically targeting a particular caste or a particular social mm -hmm. kind of, so all this you know kanhaiya said this to me in the interview that i did with him and i saw a lot of other commentators including those from the nda saying that caste is no longer an issue in bihar no one votes along caste lines that is clearly visual thinking right the, the, these kind of results show that that is still very much the primary you know voting decision making uh, metric uh, along which people vote is would, would you say that i think uh, i think the coordinates coordinates uh, because mr kumar has also created governance uh, good governance as a constituency in itself which has across the uh, group support base for him now the coordinates between governance and social economic identity now these coordinates have become important caste alone can carry you in certain assemblies but it has to find a coordinate with good governance claims so that's a more complex thing but yes the consolidation in this elections have to a large extent been two rival social coalitions and uh, but that was not enough to carry through the parties in lot of seats so the good governance claims are also important like you see in the first phase the my consolidation of uh, mahagat bandhan led by tejashwi yadav the muslim yadav uh, consolidation was strong in because the 71 seats in of first phase were in their influence area now so, some of his claims like uh, promises not claims uh, 10 lakh jobs uh, attracted across the groups uh, uh, votes also but it the base was moy now in second and third phases nda engineered a counter consolidation because the threat of mahagarvandan coming in it became too huge and uh, um, the good governance plank plus so its own social coalition of mahadalits ecbs upper caste and a section of muslims the pashmanda muslims now it all had to be consolidated on this plank because if mr nitish kumar would be measured against his own standards of last two terms in which his governance claims were far more powerful then it would have been problem for him but mm -hmm. he was measured by the standards of pre nitis era but and by the problems for him are anyway there because now bjp is like he's the third largest party right i mean yeah. does he have a future cuz bjp is going to just devour him now going forward if now that they have a very solid uh, kind of you know base there and they've cornered what what 70 seats 74 no i think uh, if they would have been in a position to dispense him they would have done it to far earlier uh, so bjp's politics is still in bihar is not possible without uh, the social coalition that mr kumar represents because he he, he has those social constituency between in nan yadav obcs and and ebcs mahadalits and a, and a very small section of muslims too so the social composition of bjp is still not in a position where it can do politics its politics in bihar without a, an obc leader of the stature of mr kumar so and the same is true for mr kumar also so both uh, are in a position where they need each other now in what proportion they need in what power dynamics they need that is a uh, question, uh, question also mr paswan the chirag paswan now uh, his damaging rule now in 31 seats in 31 seats the the loss margin of uh, jdu is less than what the chirag uh, what chirag paswan's party got Right. so 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 uh, even though uh, mr paswan's party got only one seat it damaged uh, jdu in 31 seats now 
in second and third phase bjp got jittery because there if if the speculation is if there is any truth to this speculation that he was the man picked to downside jdu now they got jittery because this game plan could have cost them this elections mm. it got so close this election was not so close if mr pashwan would have been would have sided by, uh, with uh, nda yeah. but it got close because th they were damaging jdu in 31 seats and in second and third phase bjp got very nervous and it then was more vocal in uh, backing mr kumar on, from public platforms mr uh, modi wrote a letter in which he backed nitish kumar that we need mr kumar for bihar's development and they were more vocal to clear this confusion among their core voters right so, uh, what about uh, yeah. sorry i just had a question for anand Hmm. Uh, what about all the criticism that Azadat and OAC has been getting? They're saying that he's cut into votes. He's technically supported the BJP by getting share of Muslim seats and all. Would you say that there's any credibility in those sort of theories? Oh, OAC has been working in the area, Simanchal area. Now, Simanchal area is a an area in northwest uh, Bihar, which is close right. to. which is close to bangladesh border as well as a part of west bengal now there is a high concentration of muslim votes there and uh, not uh, so it's not rjd is a, has a major presence there because muslims generally side with rjd in a two corner contest but jdu also has a has some seat has some influence there so it is not that uh, ovc is five seats he won it damaged only rjd it i think cost jdu also on two three seats oh, so okay. so so it's not that he damaged only Mm, the mahagat one then he damaged uh, a, a section of nda support also and that is yeah. jdu and i think speaking from a you know a democratic process i i honestly disagree with this criticism that he has to play second second fiddle to, to a congress or a anyone yeah. because i mean he has been a more of a serious full time politician than a tejasvi or a rahul or anyone so i can also also I can. also he tried to he tried to reach out to these parties to form an alliance and they they treated him he uh, as a, an avoidable entity because they thought that in other constituencies their alliance with ovcs party may cost them so uh, so uh, they distanced them so it is not that he he, he said that they, he reached out to mahagat vandan once but uh, they distanced him uh, themselves from him uh, so that 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 is not a valid criticism that uh, he uh, he cut their votes in this yeah i think i think yeah. rahul cuts his votes enough but uh, joanna before i come to raj jeshree uh, did you did washington post cover the bihar election if so did you go yourself how do you how do you do this and what is your take on what you saw we we did not cover the bihar elections and and we did not we did not go uh, either Uh, you know, I mean, we talked. We talked about it. I think just the thing is, for for our readers, the main prism is going to be uh, what this really means for India's national politics. And since, I mean, I think if it had been uh, a defeat for Modi and the NDA, then we would have certainly written about it and covered it. Uh, but since it turned out it wasn't, we decided to 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 not um, weigh in ourselves. And what's your take on uh, New York Times in a piece they described the Shiv Sena as a progressive party for which they were? I didn't. I didn't see that. When when did they do that? Um, uh, Anand, you you remember what piece this was? It was like four or five days ago. When it was Anand a tweet. Was it was it a was tweet. A... Tweet. It was a tweet. So it was New York Times. Yeah, when they tweet out the articles, you know, with the headline, they have a little, uh, a, mm -hmm. you know, the text of the tweet saying that a progressive party in. Maharashtra and then then they were mocked for calling Shiv Sena progressive party. Then I think they deleted that tweet. They deleted. Time. Right, right. So, uh, but uh, no. even even their even their correction was problematic. Now they delete deleted it and they corrected it, like the opposition party which uh, controls Mumbai now. <laughs> opposition parties don't control an area. The ruling party does. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, Ajayshree, what did you make of Bihar from way down south in Chennai? Was it? Oh my God! So, I have a couple. One, I agree with you on OAC. I think it's ridiculous the amount of criticism and like sort of 
shouting as he's getting on Twitter and you know, on news channels and so on. It sort of reminds me of how people were very angry with Jill Stein during the election because they said she took away Hillary Clinton's votes. But like Abhinandan said, in a democratic process, these parties have a right to exist and they have the right to to stand for election. Next, I thought it was interesting that um, an overwhelming number of women, I think, seem to have voted for the NDA in Bihar. I thought that was an interesting sort of statistic. And third, so we ran a live blog on the day of the results. So we ran it for about 11 hours, which was about 11 hours of all of us watching TV. And my God, I really think we need to change the way that we approach election coverage, especially on news channels. So I think at the early days, I mean, the early hours, the BJP and the JDU were not doing very well. So anchors started calling it saying, oh my God, BJP is conceding defeat. Then after a few hours, everything changed. So again, like those stickers and timelines. And I don't think this is how elections should be covered. I feel it just adds to the general confusion. By the end of the day, when I finished the blog, my dad asked me, he said, so which party is winning? Like what's happening? And I was like, I have no idea because TV <laughs> channels have told us everything. Like everything has happened and everything has not happened. Also, I think we really need to look at exit polls. What purpose are they serving? Because we do not have a good track record when it comes to exit polls. Like Abhinan said, that C voter times now exit poll did come very close because it predicted vote share. Mm. I think it said 36% and it was off by a couple of points. So it did very well. But why are we doing it? Because I don't know. It's I know it's a mathematical model that I don't understand. But No, it's it's a revenue generator. I mean, I've explained this um, you know, earlier in a hafta long time ago when I think when there were two elections, the Lok Sabha and the Delhi election very close to each other hmm. and every poll got it spectacularly wrong in both. Right. So basically, it is a way to keep you hooked, get sponsors on board that we have so and so exit polls, so many sample size and we will have two hour debate, five people come and sit and shout, you get a sponsor. And I was just thinking that that is like how many hours of television time wasted an exit poll that was wrong and people discuss it as if that is the result. That is the result. That is the worst so, part. But, but it is a revenue generator. It is, it is a pointless exercise which earns channels revenue and that is why they exist. And there is no other reason for them to exist. And there was a funny thing that happened there. So uh, around 1 p.m. when only 20% votes were counted. So and uh, NDA was ahead. So a television anchor asked uh, a BJP leader that only 20% votes have been counted and you are making these statements. Then he said that uh, exit poll pe aapne do din bahas kara li, abhi tab to, to 20% vote count ho gaya hai, tab to kuch bol de. <laughs> yeah, exactly, good point. Very good point. So, uh, I think uh, poll, uh, pollsters uh, as well as reporters uh, misread these elections uh, because they got carried away by more vocal voters and uh, the uh, and they discounted the support that women uh, extend to niti yeah and the likelihood of them you know taking part in these exit polls would be a lot less because they don't speak yeah uh, and uh, um, also i think is uh, while grievance reporting and this is all fine but voters are not absolutists like uh, if you have done some work and uh, you have not done some work, so uh, they will also credit you for what you have done. So uh, for uh, for like say in this distress times, now some of the relief measures in lockdown which reached villages, they were appreciated, uh, like uh, the free food grains and, and women voters have a long history and long and very long uh, list of reasons to support Nitesh for all his reservation, 35 reservation in government jobs, 50% in panchayat seats, and uh, then free bicycles, 50,000 rupees for women to uh, till the graduate level of education. Now, the, these uh, things uh, have been part of his women empowerment major. Now, some of the implementation of it may not be ideal. Now, media uh, reports only that what are the lacunae or what are the lapses in implementation, but that does not always affect voter that, okay, you, you set out to do 10 things and you, you didn't do three things, but you did seven things. And the voter tends to reward that, is what you said. Uh, re rewarded. So uh, that is one thing that voters are not absolutist in their evaluation of development work. Yeah. Second thing is that a line of uh, commentary that was taken by people more aligned to the era RJD regime of uh, 
from 90 to 2005 was that uh, erasing of public memory of uh, Jangal Raj, but it, it still counts. It is still counts because it's a lived memory and some data and some uh, kind of uh, means misplaced data because the crime reporting was so low and detection was so low in that time. So data can vary, but the general sense of security has improved in last 15 years that cannot be denied also also the line the line taken by lalu that all this jungle rust theory was a kind of upper caste conspiracy is rubbish uh, because it misgovernance and lawlessness is, lawlessness affected every group every group and uh, it, it was not that upper caste were uh, affected by every group and that is because of the rise of Nitis was because even the plank of social empowerment of Lalu was a false plank because he empowered only the Yadavs, only Yadavs within OBC. Other caste groups within Yadavs, other caste groups within Yadavs had to look for another leader for their empowerment and Dalits. So even if you go by that logic of upper caste backward class split that is also uh, a misplaced argument because the kind of empowerment that people talk about it was just yadavization of social empowerment so uh, i think uh, the erasing erasing of jungle raj memory will take more time and uh, last i would like to finish with is that the most Obvious acknowledgement of this is that Mr. Lalu Prashad Yadav's face was absent from the RJD campaign posters. Yeah, we Mr. discussed that. In fact, he kind of was distancing himself from that his son, um, Tejashri. He didn't want Lalu's shadow falling on this. So clearly, Lalu is no longer a brand that he once was. But I just want to move on to the press freedoms, which seem under attack all <laughs> over the world. Uh, in fact, in um, Philippines, the judge who had actually granted Maria Ressa bail was shot dead by her clerk. Uh, Joanna, did you did you get that news? Did you see I'm that? Sorry, I did not. So yeah, that was uh, shocking. Um, and what happened here on Arnab, there are various, um, we've discussed this in detail and we'll discuss in some more detail. But Joanna, I'd like you to weigh in, although I know from my experience of getting foreign correspondents on this show, you're always very careful because I'm sure you'll be accused of, don't tell us how to do X or Y or Z, but... Uh, <laughs> That doesn't stop me from saying what the hell I want about anybody. And, and, and we encourage everybody who participates in this on that. I mean, I would encourage an uninhibited take on it, on, on this whole Arnab circus that played out. But also, could you weigh in on, while this First Amendment is such an absolute, you know, right in the US, and probably that is the most liberal and the most evolved free speech law that we have anywhere in the world. Now, with some real world consequences of the kind of hate news that one see, you know, whether it was a pizza gate or whether it's QAnon, mm -hmm. do you think it will be revisited or like the second amendment, you can't touch that no matter what kind of damage a Breitbart uh, may do, which, which has real life consequences of, and, and to democracy itself. Like we are seeing the kind of information that is being spread through mm -hmm. tweets, through Facebook pages that the, the voting process is flawed in America. It could, it could mm -hmm. actually weaken the democratic foundation. Do you think it's time to relook at freedom of speech? Uh, but before you do that, let us know what you thought of the Arnab Circus. Were you impressed? Uh, impressed? Uh, no, I don't think I was there. I think I, I was uh, I was surprised uh, to see those scenes when he was released from jail. Um, that's that's certainly not not what I not why what I would have uh, expected. Um, and and I think uh, of course. Uh, from from my perspective, again, as as, as someone um, uh, you know who is not Indian, I would we and who is a journalist, I always welcome expressions of support for uh, freedom of the press, and and uh, of course believe that journalists uh, should not be targeted for uh, uh, their reporting. But uh, I'm, of course, it's notable that the chorus of people. Uh, in the current government who issued those expressions of support have not done so in numerous other cases. So it's just, you just can't help but being struck uh, by that uh, by that dynamic. Uh, when it comes to freedom of expression in the United States, I, I don't foresee you know any changes uh, to that uh, whatsoever uh, anytime in the near future. But I think it's important to 
when you think about your know, freedom of speech in the US, I mean, what is the First Amendment? I mean, the First Amendment basically means that, uh, except in extremely limited situations, there are no criminal consequences for speech. But that does not mean there are no consequences for speech. You can lose your job. Uh, you can uh, face a lot of public criticism. None of those are, uh, none of those uh, contravene uh, the First Amendment. So I think what you're seeing now, for example, as you discuss with social media platforms and you know, misinformation and disinformation is you're seeing that there's a lot of pressure on these companies to do a better job uh, of policing themselves. And, and that has nothing to do with the First Amendment. It just means that, you know, these, kind of, these companies have responsibility to do a better job of, you know, policing their platforms. But they clearly different standards for different countries. While, you know, they will flag a Trump's post on Facebook or Twitter in the US, here they would not do that. Uh, in fact, they flagged what uh, uh, the Assam chief minister's post as fake news. And then huh. they unflagged it. And then when they were asked why, they said, um, we don't check third party facts when it comes to politicians. I mean, I, I don't understand what that means. But do you think these companies have different uh, standards in different countries? I don't know if they have different standards. I do certainly get the sense that, that they have, you know, different resources, uh, different levels of resources devoted to, to checking this kind of stuff in different countries and also different levels of resources when it comes to different languages. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I think some of the some of their ability to uh, check things in other languages is is pretty limited, is my sense. But again, I I I, am, I, I don't I don't write about Facebook or Twitter, so <laughs> I'm I'm perhaps not the right person to ask. But uh, have you watched um, much Indian television? Uh, I have watched some Indian television, sure. <laughs> have you watched Arnab's show? I n not on a regular basis, but I, I have seen it. Yes. Yeah, I mean. Of course, not on a regular basis, but it's like radiation. Have you been exposed to it at any point? <laughs> yes, I have. So is there an equivalent in the US? I mean, not a Lou Dobbs, not a Hannity. I don't think, I can't think of any equivalent. Can anyone go that far and still mint and still retain sponsors? I mean, can you, I know Breitbart lost like eight sponsors uh -huh. in a week because of some anti-Semitic piece that they ran. Um, who was it? Um, Tucker Carlson, probably. Tucker Carlson, on Fox, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. show. Mm -hmm. um, is there any equivalent of Arnab who can say the kind of things that he says about Muslims or go that far and still retain a show in a, in a network in the US? I mean, I don't know. I mean, obviously, these types of comparisons are never, never, you know, direct um, and never kind of easy, easy to make. I think some people would say that you know, some of some, some of the stuff that's said on some of these, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess mostly, obviously, some of some of the Fox news uh, hosts, but I think in the US you would get more inflammatory stuff usually on talk radio right? as opposed to television, that's true. But I mean, <laughs> I don't want, I'm not trying to let, let, anyone, let anyone off the hook uh, here. Um, but, but I think, I mean, the, another difference I think, it's, I think, is, I think is that in Fox News has a really big reach. I think it, Republic's reach I think oh, yeah, it's, of course. It's a little less. Compare it because of a the language heterogeneity. I mean, yeah, it doesn't have that. Right. But, I mean, Steve Bannon did ask for you know Dr. Fauci's yes. head to be severed and put on pics. Yes. At the White House on and, radio again. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. on radio. Uh, Twitter has suspended him indefinitely from their platform, and uh, apparently his lawyer also walked out. He said, "I can't represent this guy anymore." Well, that'll be an interesting trial next year when he was on trial. Yes. Uh, but Jeshri, um, your take on this whole, I mean, there's just so many headlines and I mean, we'll wait on the cases on the Republic TRP and stuff, but his, after he was released yesterday, did he go straight to a studio? Or I, I didn't watch last night. What happened? I'm not sure, but I think Joanna was being very uh, polite about the scenes when he was released. I mean, the man was literally standing, what I think he was standing out of the sunroof of a car. He was shouting, Bharat Mata Ki Jai. He would shout Vande and the crowd would shout back Matram, like, I have, I mean, we've seen a lot of political rallies, but this was something extraordinarily amazing. Like, it was ridiculous. And also, I think it bears repeating several times that he was not, in this particular instance, he was not targeted for his reporting. It was not a press freedom issue at all. It was in connection with a completely different case, which was abetment to suicide. Like, yeah, that investigation ongoing, whatever. But in this case, no, he was not a 
tap for being a journalist for the voice i think that's the technicality they chose but i think yeah. political i mean i we discussed it at length so we won't repeat that last year you know he's a political agent and yeah and political battle so and but i have do think that when the supreme court uh, finally gave him bail they gave that great speech on liberty and you know how the high court should also provide liberty and i mean it's good to see the supreme court waking up to the concept of liberty considering like sada bhartwa has been in jail for what, 800 ish 800 odd days sharjil aman has been in jail for nearly 300 days and arnab's bail petition came up so quickly he waited 6 days and then he was out other people are waiting years and they're getting no closer to the end mm. so i mean people will say oh but this is the law at work but the law is showing a double standard that i think is shocking i, I don't think anyone can defend or deny that uh, the kind of influence he has yeah. is got nothing to do with justice it is just pure influence yeah and i mean i, I think, think he sh- sorry sorry yeah go ahead now i was going to say i think yeah it's i do agree that he should have got bail but bail should be the norm i just don't i think there are others who oh, are more i think it's a it's a question of influence and who has more influence where uh, in what court i mean even technically speaking after the high court rejected it they should have gone back to the sessions court to get bail yeah i don't understand why they didn't, didn't go because, why didn't he go to the sessions court because mr salve was probably more confident of getting bail in the supreme court i mean that you speak to any lawyer in the supreme court in delhi and i've spoken to enough they'll tell yeah. you why it happened but uh, you know it's not, uh, but I, i you know i think the one thing that is very clear and having been um, you know part of the founding members of the jan lokpal movement and before that organizing many protests and rallies during my youth when i was young as an activist and stuff you cannot you're, you're still young i mean i'm 46 <laughs> yeah. I, i i didn't say that but yes <laughs> but i i'm talking about when i was in my 20s and early 30s and i know even that the jan lokpal movement was happening um you know whether it was getting the help of shri shri ravi shankar's organization whether it was getting help of smaller if not political organizations outfits that work in this space you cannot gather a crowd having done that on something that was purely a political at the time and not just one i have organized many such a crowd that came for arnab cannot be done without the backing of a large collective whether it is a you know political party whether it is a trade union yeah. that crowd does not get, and anyone who is in politics i'm not talking about studio politics but working on the ground or anyone who's in an activism will tell you that and i think that was the final evidence if any was needed that this is entirely a political maneuver right and um, anyway i i i i just i tweeted i said you know because there were all these videos going around where arna be saying i don't care about the rule of law you know when you <laughs> those alleged rapists were killed or when someone these terrorists should be taken to jail arrest riya now throw her this i don't care about what process is well i hope now he will care i would like to see what he says now but the only thing is now on his panel he will not get even the slight rather weak uh, opposition he used to get yeah because now he'll only have askers as and yes men on his panel because he is so weak he's on such a weak ground now that he could be punctured too easily so i, I think you'll see a change in his panels even those token opposition voices will not be there because they can puncture his past too easily anand what did you make of it and what do you think is he a, a journalist a political actor a circus clown what 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 do you think and what do you think of the release he has been uh, branded himself as say part j- journalist and part showman <laughs> and and part performer also so it is combination of all these things i think there was a space for the stream of the stream of political or social opinion that he represented but not the degree of it but not the degree of it and not the aesthetics of it and also not the extremities of it let us put it that way but there within the english media space there was a there was a, uh, i think opening for that kind of political opinion to be represented but uh, but he took it to a level of caricature he he is a caricature of that opinion so even that opinion is not represented in his voice 
so that is it so, second is if opinions are divided the be best thing is to go by the formal structures and rule of uh, law rule of law so uh, i am i have repeatedly said on this um, podcast that uh, i i don't believe in the theory of abatement of suicide because that's a very dangerous things to do anything can happen in your office and some note is found and anything can anything can be blamed on anybody so uh, i uh, because suicide is a very complex and personal decision what actually prompted with whether a note is enough evidence to uh, implicate someone or i i'm not a firm believer in it but if if on the day arna was arrested for it it was the law of the land then he should be arrested i, I believe it on that line because if the opinions are divided let us take the recourse of law for so on that day if it was the law he should be arrested there can be no opin- opinion about it uh, so there can be opinion but it is my opinion I mean, there can be a lot of opinions about it but it, in my opinion uh, he should be arrested the release the release of uh, as the, the other panelists also pointed out that it's more uh, uh, they are celebrity their celebrity they will play celebrity victim more than say but even in uh, on a micro level say in uh, small towns this uh the case more in focus the case more in focus the case which generates more public attention if uh, the prosecution side does not have a very solid case the chances of bail get higher so uh, that is case everywhere miss uh, and uh, he played the profit uh, with the profitable victim or to the hilt and uh, of course uh, the powerful men around him helped him that's what anand says about you know suicide uh, i mean i completely agree with him this abatement of suicide i think is unique to the indian you know law books uh, i i'm not sure if in most liberal democracies such a law exists but i remember the us a few years ago there was a case of i think these college kids in um, in in california i'm not sure if it was in san francisco where they kind of put a hidden camera and they outed this uh, other student um, you know he was gay and he you know got a, a friend or a partner in and they recorded and streamed his um, intimacy there and that guy i think jumped off the golden great bridge and killed himself and the two who live streamed were brought before a judge <clears throat> and the judge said some very harsh words but they weren't imprisoned for abetment to suicide or any such thing because how people react to something no matter how horrible some how horrible an act is is very subjective do you remember this case and i do remember the case but i don't remember what ended up happening with the with the legal they were fined i think um i think they were sentenced to probation community service Uh, community for, service yes, they did community service and the and the judge had some very cyber um, bullying and, and all i think the, uh, they put yeah, nasty up things, things to say to them but there was no like now you go to prison that I mean, that didn't happen and and it, there was a direct connect um so uh, what do you think is is this a case that really should be there in the statute books in your view the uh, abatement to suicide yeah that's uh that's that's a, that's a big question <laughs> i mean it is it is a kind of uh alien concept coming from the united states it's true that i i don't really i don't i agree with you i don't think there's anything as far as i know on the statute books in that regard uh in uh in the us so so no i mean i i think i think these things are difficult i mean i think there are i mean i think there are circumstances in which you know you can potentially do kind of like a manslaughter um case in the US if you really i mean i don't know if yeah, i i don't i mean again i'm not a prosecutor i'm not a prosecutor <laughs> but but i think under certain kind of very um limited circumstances it could make sense but i but i understand it, that this the case that you're describing is obviously a terrible tragedy but one where it could be difficult to describe kind of assign a criminal responsibility I think the famous case in the US was of the girl um whose boyfriend died by suicide and uh I think she was charged with in 
I think with involuntary manslaughter because she had encouraged right. him over text message or something yeah. too. Yeah. Right. So I think that was so in the US, I suppose the I mean what we would call a betment to suicide, but they would charge them under like I think for the case that Abhinandan was talking about, they were charged for privacy and yeah. In, in like this, they should directly like, told him to I guess kill himself. Yeah. She was charged yeah. under a different charge, but you know I think that this why this law exists and maybe there is a way to define it. And why it is justified is, um, I mean, when I was in my teens, there used to be this. Uh, I mean, Anand, I don't know whether you remember, uh, whether you were old enough. You know, there used to be all Doordarshan pe ads aate the about dowry deaths. If a woman didn't get dowry, there were these, you know, suddenly uh, um, stoves would catch fire. There was a state of people who got burnt, right? Mm. Women who got burnt while cooking. Mm. And there was many cases where if the mother-in-law and the husband didn't burn her themselves, they would make life so miserable for her that they said, kill yourself. That is your only escape. You know, where you get beaten up, where there's not getting enough to eat, getting humiliated in front of your kids. So women would douse themselves and it became this trend of, uh, does anyone remember this? No. Yes, 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 yes. So it was that entire dowry death thing, you know. So at that time, there were many convictions, especially in Punjab, for abetment to suicide because they pretty much made a woman kill herself because they didn't want to do it themselves. In many cases, they did it themselves. Uh, and that's when this dowry became a huge issue and there were laws. But I mean, I can only think of that is the only case where I've seen uh, of all the ones that I've you know read about over the last two, three decades, where you, you can convict someone for really causing someone's death. Other than that, how are you going to prove this? I mean, I just don't. I, I mean, my guess is they're going to arrest Arnab for, uh, you know, assaulting a police officer. You know, they'll come after him in another case. They don't want to stop. He's yeah. He's applying for bail, anticipatory bail today. I think in that case. So, but I don't know. I feel abetment to suicide already. Uh, various high courts across the country have said. I mean, they, they, I think the courts also have a slightly hard time when it comes to defining it. I remember there was one case uh, where. A court said, but however, if the victim is hypersensitive, then we cannot say this was abetment to suicide because the victim himself or herself is very sensitive to criticism. So therefore, so I mean, it's very difficult to define what is a straightforward. I think uh, uh, during last evening's uh, hearing, the one of uh, the lawyers uh, told the judge that suppose uh, uh, tomorrow some says that my cases were regularly being adjourned for further hearings and uh, um, he writes in suicide note uh, so should the judge be charged with abetment to suicide so uh, if, if that person uh, commits suicide now uh, you see like a deb case that he was uh, um, Arnav was owing this much money to him or this now uh, the individual element comes that uh, every person in those circumstances would not commit suicide. So right. uh, there are other ways of dealing with, uh, uh, say, distress uh, and uh, adverse circumstances. Now, the year, the year I, I uh, failed in my last attempt in civil services. Now, one of uh, my university batchmates committed suicide. He he also. Uh, mm, set for the same exam, he also failed. Now he committed suicide. So uh, he, he, he now the same circumstances can uh, trigger different kind of responses. Now, if you take into account uh, the individual variations in it, and and then you uh, uh, suppose he would have written that uh, my teachers and my coaches. Uh, didn't support me and I failed in my examination and so so you you try all teachers and so I think that would be uh, that's an uh, maybe not a very related example no, but, but yeah. I mean that there's so many real world comparisons I get what you're saying it's it's very hard to prove that but nevertheless I think I mean at least I'm trying to extract a silver lining is that now that so many people have weighed in on the freedom of the press and ministers have weighed in. I think uh, everyone from the news community is um, well within um, our, uh, you know, posturing and and questioning uh, and putting them in uncomfortable positions. That now, how about you 
have the same take on many of the other cases. So uh, I, I, I feel think like that's very optimistic. Like, <laughs> I feel like we've always had bad things happen and a bad thing will happen to like a very high up or senior person. <laughs> but I mean, nothing. Fun. I don't think Arnab is going to go back to his studio now and like, sort of contemplate on his six days in jail or ch and change his approach. I think I mean it'd be great if it happened, but I just don't see it ever happening. So I don't see the courts now moving faster or like public politicians moving faster on cases of activists being in jail for years because if they were going to, they'd run it by now. But right. So uh, Joanna has to leave. So I just want to have a couple more questions for her and then she can uh, just give us her recommendation. Sure. Joanna, you've been covering India for how long now? Uh, this time, uh, about two and a half years. And before this? Uh, I was, I mean, I was based in Mumbai from 2000 to 2004. Right. Which city do you prefer, by the way? Oh, you're going to get me in so much trouble with that question. <laughs> I, I have, I got, I... <laughs> Let me put it this way: uh, Delhi has its charms, uh, but uh, but but Bombay is the, a special a special place in my heart. So, okay, clearly it's Bombay, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I I love Delhi and the Diwala out now. No, uh, you know, before you go, I just wanted your view on as a foreign correspondent. You know, when you're covering uh, India, I remember in '99, I think it was Anand knows remembers dates very well. I think I was back then. I was a, no, I think I had quit news track when the Time magazine carried an article which said, which spoke about uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's fondness for his night tipple. And the day that magazine hit the stands, that same evening, the Time magazine bureau chief or whatever they had here was on his flight back to the US. His visa was cancelled. What year was that? Do you remember, Anand? I think it was 2002. 2001 or two years. Yeah. I was here then too. I seem to recall that article was about uh, it was about not about his tipple, but about him, you know, um, losing his losing his faculties. I thought that he was kind of falling asleep and you know was not mentally kind of with. Well, yeah, anymore. it's it, it said many things, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> but basically, the article, the guy was out the same evening. I mean, it didn't even take twenty four hours. As a foreign correspondent covering India, which is this very interesting mix of we have a lot of freedoms. I mean, look at the kind of things, you know, we see on our podcast and yet one always living under the threat of this sword hanging over you, you know, while one says a lot, you never know when it could get you into serious trouble. W what is the kind of line you have to walk? Let's pretend it's on India, any other country, which is a democracy, but maybe with not as liberal democracy as many uh, in the West. I mean, how far can you go in your critique sitting here? That's a, that's a very good question. I, I don't think anyone at the moment is quite uh, knows where that line is. I mean, I think, uh, as you pointed out with that, with that Vajpayee story, I don't think anyone could have predicted at that point in time, you know, what story on what topic is going to, you know, elicit a response <laughs> kind of like that, just completely uh, uh, out, of, uh, out of the blue and out of the ordinary. Um, no, I don't. I think I think that's something we have to find out. I, to be honest, I don't. I try not to give that topic a lot of thought uh, because, you know, once once you start, I think trying to understand where the line is, then that's you know, as you know, obviously, you know, going that's going down the slope of kind of making uh, bargains with yourself, even. Uh, so, uh, I I don't know where the line is. I try not to think about it. I. <laughs> I think it's obviously a different calculus for for foreign for foreign journalists, and we just try to do the best stories that we can and the stories that we were going to do anyway. But surely you'll admit this much that if you were in a White House at a press conference, mm -hmm. the confidence and the uninhibitedness with which you'd ask a question is not the same that you would if you were in the press conference here. I'm not sure that's true. I think we would have to have a press conference with the prime minister first <laughs> in order to test that theory. Right. Okay. But if you were to test that theory in your head, there would I be like a to, no. I like no. I like to think that I don't. I mean, I, I like to think that I would uh, ask the same question, whatever question I was going to ask. Uh, I would. I would ask it. I mean, what's kind of what's what's the point otherwise? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think there's a difference between, you know, asking a question that someone considers, you know, hostile or impertinent, you know, with uh, reporting, you know, something, you know, that may make someone, you know, 
someone in a powerful position, uh, I rate, uh, I mean, I would like to think I wouldn't hesitate on either front, but certainly I would not hesitate to ask a question. Right, thanks, Joanna. What's your recommendation before we say bye-bye and thank you for joining us? So my recommendation uh, would be something out of the ordinary. I don't know how many of you have watched this Netflix series, Crash Landing from Korea. Uh, very good uh, distraction, totally different uh, a story about a uh, South Korean heiress who uh, lands in North Korea by mistake in a paragliding accident and falls in love with a North Korean soldier. Uh, very, uh, very entertaining. Right. So thank you, Joanna. Oh, happy Diwali. Thank you all. Be happy safe. Diwali to all of you. Happy Stay Diwali. safe. All right. Bye. Take good care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Before we close, I have a few emails that have come, which I'd read out and I'd like Jayashree and Anand's views on that. This one is from Ziauddin Zoheb. Hi, all this is regarding NL Hafta 300. I've listened to Abhinandan's views on Muhammad Ahmad Saab. I remember a saying by a wise man. I don't have a problem with secularism. Religions can accommodate secularism slash atheism, but secularism and atheism cannot accommodate any other religion. How is it freedom of thought when you disregard someone just because that person has a different view on homosexuality than you do? It is possible that you could be wrong as well. As long as people do not openly stop others from indulging in homosexuality and do not do any violence against homosexual people, they should not be condemned. They have a right to their opinion too. You have the right to see homosexuality as good, but at the same time, other people should have the right to feel that homosexuality is a sin. Again, they should not do any violence against the homosexual community. Coming to your concern regarding marriage because there are more number of males compared to females, homosexuality is not a solution. Let me offer a case study. Imagine there are 15 people. Okay, um, you want to say that we should look at rational solutions like saving girl children, marrying widows. Uh, now, uh, I'm sorry if I offended someone. Freedom of thought is important to everyone, whether you are a religious person or not. Regard Zia. So Jayashree and Anand, do you know the context of what Zia is saying? Uh, you weren't there the last hafta, right? Ha, but I, I mean, I know what he's talking about. So the context is that I had interviewed uh, Muhammad Ahmad Saab, and I spoke about that last uh, from the jamaat islami and he had shared his views on homosexuality, and I had kind of made fun of him. Now, Zia, I'm not saying he shouldn't have the right to have his views. I think that's too basic uh, an argument. Everyone has a right to have any views they want. Uh, but I just think some of those views are really ridiculous and bizarre and offensive. And just so you know, and I had a talk with him and I think it's there in the interview. It, it is not just this benign considering homosexuality a sin in his head. He pretty much says that if he is allowed to write the law, he will make it illegal, which means it's punishable. So, and I also disagree, I, I mean, that quote that you've said, I don't have a problem with secularism, religions can accommodate secularism, but secularism and atheism cannot accommodate any religion. A, I'm not atheist, I'm religious, I believe in God and I pray. I find the kind of religiosity that people like Muhammad Saab, and I, and I will say, personally, he's a very warm, wonderful man, but his ideas are reprehensible. He has every right to have those ideas, just like I have every right to call them out as bullshit. And you have the right to call mine out as bullshit. And in this kind of conversation, better ideas stay. Stupid ideas get rejected over time. And I hope ideas like his get rejected over time. And I have no doubt they will. Um, anyone else want to chip in on this mail before I move on to the rest? Yeah, I mean, you can feel what you want. You can think what you want. But if people are telling you that what you think is prejudiced and unscientific, I mean, them's the blows but also it doesn't give you the right to dictate what someone can or cannot do and in the letter the theory of now how to get more women to be so therefore the, there'll be more women available for marriage that has nothing to do with anything that, I, I, think that was because I, I said that in jest because you know when i was like oh god how okay. i agree when i was talking to him i said you are not allowing homosexuality at the same time you are allowing for marriages so and then i gave him the breakup of india gender I said, where does that leave people like me? There are 250 million excess men. So we have to seek out other men. And then, we'd... so I was, of course, being facetious. I think subscriber was, took it a little seriously. But yeah, so. Yeah, I think. So, uh, Anand, you have, you want to weigh in on this? One uh, thing is that uh, this whole idea about 
uh, opposing uh, certain sexual practices or this uh, now it comes from a kind of fetishism when uh, even in from religious sources uh, the interpretation sometimes uh, are dogmatically developed into a fetish and uh, even from a conservative point of view you have to change in order to conserve the the basic things if you want to conserve this you have to change you have to uh, change they may be very piecemeal improvements but uh, uh, to conserve the core of a belief system you need to uh, adapt to the growing body of evidence uh, against some of the fetishes that you have developed and uh, the uh, blend of that continuity with change uh, has to define your worldview you if you have a conservative point of worldview uh, otherwise just uh, dogmatically fetishizing everything i am, and i am not sure if uh, the old texts have dealt with uh, these things very uh, minutely but what but uh, yes you have to look at both sides of it and um, and of course uh, saying what one believes or what one thinks is a non-negotiable and that would not be an issue i think uh, some of the remarks made in uh, lighter way and he took it seriously seriously right yeah that's and this mail is from rajat talwani rajat has referred to everyone he's talking to as ma'am and sir so i will not read out ma'am and sir you don't have to call us sirs and ma'ams so Rajat says, greetings NL team. My name is Rajat. I'm 24 years old. I'm an MBBS intern based in Indore. I'm a subscriber for two months and the guilt trip following Vinanda's relentless move at core free me at night at the end of every YouTube interview made me subscribe. About last week's hafta, while I agree with Jeshri and Manisha's argument of France's double standards in handling white extremism and the power imbalance between Muslims and non-Muslims, I think Abhinandan is right in saying that though in a polarized world, we have today, people are quick to take offense at almost anything. But that is mostly a result of political conditioning by political parties, fanning religious societal tension for political gains. But in the case of Islam, the outrage is because of religious conditioning. There is a written law against blasphemy and the punishment for it, unlike most other religions. This reminds me of Dr. Ambedkar's argument about social reform preceding political reform mentioned in the annihilation of caste. He said that progressive Hindus desired change in the political image of the religion but were averse to the idea of a complete reform in the religious structure itself vis-a-vis -vis the Gandhian way of handling the caste inequalities, while Ambedkar argued that a concrete and long-lasting reform needs to come from the complete abolishment of caste. This is exactly the type of reform Islam needs today when it comes to blasphemy. Calling for that reform and speaking against the blasphemy law cannot be Islamophobia, as Abhinandan pointed out. I also want to point to an interesting audio long read, and you have recommended Confessions of a Killer Cop by The Guardian. Uh, it's a story of Herojit based in Manipur. So I'll definitely check it out. I love these uh, long audios. And he also suggests other long reads that we should do. Thank you, Raja. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for your support. Um, but I guess this is a kind of also taking, I mean, it, what, what Anand spoke about having to change with the times uh, applies to this as well. Then Rajat Kondal says, I'm a subscriber. I've been spending the last few weeks in my lovely home state of Himachal. Totally loving it. Visited many obscure places. I'm also into paragliding and the weather has been great for the last so many weeks. Wow, dude, paragliding. That's... <laughs> Remember that video of that guy, mad, whatever, MC who jo yaha aya. <laughs> Funniest video I saw in a long time. Anyway, that I, I find that one of the scariest things when just jumping off a cliff. Anyway, uh, silver lining to my COVID cloud. Jannate Naseeb. For Himachal English news, I rely on the Tribune website. I would like the panel to discuss these news items. The serious one and the joke. Thanks and keep up the good work. Now, the serious one is uh, really shocking, actually. Uh, it's from the Tribune website. Pong Austis allotted land in Thar Desert feel cheated. This speaks about, you know, a dam that was to be built and the villages that whose land was taken. Those villages allotted land in Jaisalmer district of Rajasthan, which is barren and it has no facilities. Imagine being sent from here to there. I, but really, man, it's shocking. But when it comes to people being, what's the word? When you are 
kicked out your land because of a dam you are displacement uh, displaced the displacement and what are the a lot of i didn't know till i read many articles about this there are still people who have been displaced by the bhakra nangal dam construction who still haven't got their land and that was nehru's time so yeah man this is a really disturbing story uh, and the other story which is really funny i shall read that out call for jagati as all deity is not invited to the shara festival <laughs> a jagati which is a congregation of gods and goddesses of the district will be held at the premise of lord raghunath on november 16 as some deity is demanded that it was not right not to allow all deities to participate in the dashera festival the deities through their oracles or gurus said that serious consequences will have to be faced if the human beings interfere in the tradition this is basically because there are 300 deities participate in the dashera festival because of the pandemic only seven or eight were invited and it has led to this major you know pachda over there only 14 deities participated out of 300 so why weren't the other deities invited so apparently those deities are unwell and they have communicated that to their followers Who this is like them? this is like the gods they are just like us i i can't i can't believe stuff like this happens or see they are not this now maybe these guys are right that there is some deity who is telling them mujhe party mein invite nahi kiya the shara wali ja ke pachda machao but as long as that god shows up i think i am of course i'm well within my right i won't even go there i think i am more rationally on solid ground to make fun of these people so that's my view um Anand, any view on that mail? Again, this is a fetishization of a of a practice. Like uh, this is not a very core part of pop, even popular religion. Now, uh, there must be a group of people who have fetishized it that this is the only way to do that. Now, uh, it's a peripheral to the. Performance of even this ritual, uh, but okay. There's the, क्या कह सकते हैं अब इस पर क्या कर सकते हैं क्या कह सकते हैं भाई भाई पर माया आपने लेकिन जो ही कहते हैं हाय महराज उस राइट व्हेन ही सेड दैट विक्टिम्स ऑफ अमेरिका रियली डोंट केयर फॉर ऑप्टिक्स बिसाइड्स कमला हैरिस इज वीपी ओनली बिकॉज़ डेम्स वांटेड टू प्रोजेक्ट देमसेल्व्स एस फेमिनिस्ट बाय द वे दे हैड एंटायरली डिसमिस द सेक्सुअल असॉल्ट एलिगेशंस अगेंस्ट जो बाइडेन लिबरल हिपोक्रेसी एट इट्स बेस्ट देयर इज डेफिनेटली अ डिफरेंस बिटवीन डेमोक्रेट्स एंड रिपब्लिकंस लेट मी स्पेल इट आउट फैसिज्म लाइट वर्सेस फैसिज्म it worries me that progressives look at the election result in usa as if racism and misogyny have been solved for good uh joy my view on this is everything is not fascism and everything is not racism and everything is not sexism because if you do that then there is no move forward and i don't think any rational people least of all the panelists who appear on hafta think anything is for good whether it is the solution to racism or communism or corruption uh no election is the full stop it is only an event until the next and the next and the next so there yeah, are no final things here then prakash writes hi nel team i like the spirited discussion between manisha bhandana and mehraj on incidents in europe manisha mentioned france not having assimilated arabs into their society as an immigrant myself i'm curious what exactly she means by that i live in the us and have traveled a bit in europe as well and my experience is that most of these white majority developed countries are roughly the same for individual liberty there are some differences between these white countries but as we say 19 20 20 ka fark hai lekin fark hai i agree with the state and the rest of society the interactions are mostly transactional and they go fairly smoothly in workplace and neighborhoods also the friendliness varies between societies but it's not hostile either indians mostly hindus and sikhs are held up as model minority in us and in praise for having assimilated i find that an exaggeration indians just live the way they want to and enjoy the positives of us and their values don't really clash with the west even though they are so vastly different in that sense i feel assimilation is overrated and it never truly happens you just figure out how to tolerate or ignore the inconvenient differences not really savor or celebrate those differences which aren't really clashes per se her second point about the clash of civilizations i agree with and that somewhat negates the possibility of assimilation agar itni dikkat hai dusre se to shanti se rahenge bhi kaise what should the state and individuals from dominant community do specifically to help the process of assimilation that's a question and the countries where such assimilation of muslims are there countries where such an assimilation of muslims is successful if so what steps were taken by those countries so manisha is on leave um, i will keep this letter for when mehraj is here as well but Uh, you have any answers to his questions jayshree anand 
Okay, when I, I think that when he says assimilation is overrated, I mean, there's a difference between non-assimilation and a difference between the ghettoization of some Muslim communities, which is what happened in France, as to which countries have uh, model examples of assimilation. I mean, you hear of racism at various levels everywhere. Some are worse and some are better. So, yeah, that's something I really don't know. But also about Indians assimilating well and all, I mean, are they really, I mean, we paper over all the worst parts of things that we hear about, we paper over all the racism, we paper over all the casteism that we're seeing, and then we say that things are great, but they're not. So I think it's okay to acknowledge that. Anand? No, I think I take your line that uh, if there is a particular mail regarding a particular comment by a panelist, he should be present to respond to that. Yeah. Right. So we we'll let Manisha come back and explain. Uh, but since I was on that panel last time, Prakash, all I will say is that I don't think there is a country where this has happened. There could be a place in time. Like I think, you know, whether it was Irish or Germans coming in, the racism was towards a different community at a different time in a different America. Or the same thing when it comes to South Indians in many Punjabi neighborhoods of Delhi. And same thing may be true, but for a particular time, it was fine. Then one incident can overturn that. So I can think of many instances, specifically in states, countries, but for a time period where assimilation seemed, you know, not complete, but a healthy equilibrium, but that changes as political churns happen, I think. So there's no, I mean, there's no static point where this is how it is. Uh, then this email is from Sumit. Hi, Hafta team. Excellent work on episode 301. I found the discussion on equating politicians across generations particularly fascinating. While I agree with you, Abhinandan, that Vajpayee took the onus of trying to improve Indo-Pak relations, I think Meharaj makes an interesting point about personality laundering. You see, in every generation of politicians, there is someone who legitimizes an otherwise regressive thought process. So while we look at Advani and Vajpayee as moderates today, we need to understand that their actions and words leg legitimize the bigotry we see from Modi and Shah today. Modi and Shah in turn may be called Vikas boys in the future while you compare them to people they have legitimized, the yogis and suryas. The problem with giving certain people a free pass is that they pass the bit on to other people who ride on their free passes and do far worse. What do you think? This apart, I have a one line observation. I have one little observation. Uh, Okay, what he says that whenever I want to move on, I say right, which means that let's move on. And he says, and Atul says, theek baat hai. And he says, even though the baat is not theek, and what is being said is not right. <laughs> but that is what we do to move on. Thank you for your support and for your subscription. On the bit about passing the bit on, I think you're right. Uh, but at the same time, I do think people, there's an inevitability of comparing leaders across times. But it will always be inaccurate and often flawed because contexts change, the environment changes, trends change, what matters to a society changes. So, I mean, yes, what you're saying is right. But at the same time, I, I don't think Modi and Vajpayee are the same thing. I mean, I, 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 or Modi and Yogi are the same thing. No, I, I don't think that kind of simplification of leaders uh, is accurate. Jayashree, what do you think? Uh, I agree with Sumit. I think that, uh, yeah, what former leaders did allows their current leaders to act with more impunity, perhaps. But also, I think, I mean, with time and with distance, it's very difficult to remember what times were like at particular points of time, like when the Babri Masjid came down, what were leaders saying, what were they discussing. But now, in retrospect, when we're looking at Yogi Atatinath's Uttar Pradesh now, and if we have issues with that, that Babri Masjid no longer seems as fresh in your mind as to what you're seeing today. So, yeah, but it's, like you said, it's not a simplistic sort of thing. Arun, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I means uh, that is his point of view, but uh, and there are a lot of people who are aligned to uh, a different uh, uh, system of political beliefs. So uh, for them, uh, it would be a different uh, kind of evaluation of leadership and um, they would just think that Mr. Modi is more decisive or, or say Mr. Yogi Adinath is more closer to um, the uh, 
pet agenda or something so uh, depends who is saying also i think in practical politics uh, uh, everything has not to be geared towards something I means you don't live to be uh, realizing an ideal so uh, even in mr modi's uh, brand of politics or mr yagin adityanath or mr vajpayee's you will find a lot of things which are not geared towards what they are supposed to do so uh, the theoretical and practical aspects of politics may not always form a coordinate um, but uh, i may be digressing but what i am saying is that uh, it depends it depends on whom you are talking to you uh, talking to me. Uh, they are there because there are enough number of people in india who uh, uh, share a kind of political belief system which supports them that is right now this subscriber wants to remain anonymous um he or she says according to me and pardon me if i'm repeating what was said and also for discounting nuance anything done with the intention of dissemination he is talking about terrorism like last podcast you were trying to define what is terrorism and i said it i find it i i can't understand when that word is used and when it's not used because i don't see any consistency so what mr anonymous says is anything done with the intention of disseminating fear or terror in a community is terrorism it could be an individual an organization or even an abstract idea the violence at a company's hurt egos with mostly men assaulting women for simply saying no does result in a message that a woman's opinion is inconsequential it might not be organized but even this institutionalized mentality creates fear sometimes i can't help but wonder how women walk the streets with the confidence they do bajrang dal's attacks on couples in mangalore and pubs still cast a shadow of caste apprehension over loving and doing whatever the hell one wants so i guess you're saying that's terrorism various instances of violence against lgbtqia+ community like the orlando nightclub shooting and the recent murder of trans rights activist and entrepreneur sangeeta in coimbatore all contribute to the diffusion of terror within the community psyche pushing us deeper into shells we occupy the same applies in caste and religious based violence messaging that attempts to birth far reaching fear by threatening consequences i would go so far as to claim that society as a whole is a terrorist organization the constant unsavory reactions to much needed changes to the status quo using the mostly conservative religious and culturally rooted machinery of social control is also basically a use of fear or terror to, to ensure the privileged the perpetuation of their supremacy okay wow that's a lot i mostly disagree with you anonymous like i said if everything is terrorism then nothing is terrorism that's all i have to say on this um, jayshree i for me i guess terrorism very specifically or uh, i would look at it as you know inter country violence force or something but yeah no this i think this is a very broad sort of definition of terrorism that doesn't really work for me and to say that all societal violence or violence in the name of all religion caste is terrorism is sort of diluting the purpose of why we have a term for terrorism as it is right so anand no i i agree with what jeshri said see this is a very academic and radical kind of literature that people sometimes read that uh, uh, what what it is he is saying is uh, what is termed as structural violence in academic jargon and uh, they related to some forms of terrorism also but uh, i agree with both of you that uh, you have a see very common sensical and banal thing you have a seven, say 100 years of life in your lifetime you would not get read of the society or everything else or, or what you can get read of is the external manifestation of physical violence intimidation and, uh, and the acts which terrorize a group of people or individuals now in simple parlance that is terrorism and that is uh, the meaning i would like to attach to it so uh, as you said if everything is terrorism then nothing is terrorism so uh, let us uh, what uh, have conceptual uh, clarity about uh, distinguishing between different things you may what you were theorizing about maybe something else but for our conceptual clarity we have to define terrorism in a particular way right so and this is the last mail from kapil 
Kapil, uh, first of all, starts by saying that I just want to report that your website does not seem to work on Safari or Mac in the UK. Um, so, um, a couple and all the others, thank you so much, first of all, for giving the inputs on the new website and what we should fix and what we shouldn't. Most of the bugs have been sorted out, but we are finding that in Australia, uh, you know, a couple of subscribers have written that on particular browsers, the web does not open efficiently. And there are a few other cases on specific phones and browsers. So hopefully by the time this podcast is uploaded, most would have been sorted. If they haven't, do continue to write and tell us where it's not working. So we'll figure out why. But some of the you know, uh, places where it was acting up uh, should be fixed by the time you listen. And also, this hafta is still outside the paywall because the process of logging into the podcast player and then logging in again as a subscriber was not efficient. So until we get the entire logging in process fully efficient, so you don't have to log in twice to listen to the podcast behind the paywall, we will keep it outside. But I think by next week, we should have all those things figured out and the crease is done. So do keep telling us what you think of the new website so that we can incorporate best practices into the app. And then Kapil goes on to ask, a couple of weeks ago, you guys discussed about reporters not revealing their sources. If reporters don't reveal their sources, does it not give them the free hand to make up stories? If a journalist reports a story that turns out to be a lie, should he not be held accountable? If she... He is not willing to reveal his source, then he should be punished for blindly trusting the source. In my opinion, we should assume he has made up the story. That seems straightforward to me. What am I missing? Kapil, we had a fairly nuanced talk about this. I think you've kind of simplified it into just they don't have to reveal their source. When you have an editor, you have an editorial process. It is not that many ke bol diya, bhai, ye hai ab chhap do. You know, there's a certain filter that goes through Jayashree and Raman uh, and, and uh, Mehraj, then you know, Raman takes a call on what can go, what cannot. Often the editor can say, I will not carry this until you reveal the source. And this comes to a subjective call. Certain people have like, if you've seen the bull story, till date, so Cheta Dalal has not revealed who gave her the tip off about the Harshad Mehta story. But it was a true story. So as a reporter, you have to know when you're being played, when you're not. And like I said, you often triangulate your information. You just don't take, Mujhe bata diya, main chhap diya. That is how journalism is done. It's not a, it's not a theorem. There are a lot of judgment calls and often you get them wrong. And like, um, what was the name that New York Times writer, Judith Miller, she did jail time, but then you do jail time. What else? But yeah, that's how it works. Um, Jayashree, Anand, you want to yeah, comment? Yeah, to add to your example also, I mean, if a source says something, you're not going to blindly say, yes, my source is correct and publish it without verifying, without doing other fact checks, without... Also, in Scam 92, uh, there was that one bit where the journalist says, my source is saying this and I want to run the story. You know, editors are like, no, you need to cross-check it with somebody else. And at that, in the show itself, I mean, the editors come off looking slightly villainous. But what they did was absolutely correct. You cannot blindly trust your source. You do verify and you do fact check. So things go through processes. It's not like I'm making it up because I'm basing it off my source. Yeah, it's not that simple. Yeah. Anand, do you want to weigh in before I wind up? Yes, yes. Uh, what uh, I agree with what uh, uh, you people said. Uh, just one thing I would like to add that if uh, sometimes uh, th there is a slackening of this uh, editorial scrutiny, if the allegation is not uh, very, say, huge, and um, uh, if the allegation is huge, the story is big, then the scrutiny is tighter. But uh, I think the same scrutiny has to be done with all kinds of stories. If the, uh, sometimes you see in newspapers that uh, it, there is a very minor story about, say, a car accident, which may be false, but it, it does not go through same kind of scrutiny, uh, say, that if an allegation of a terror plot is there. So, right. That's so true. I think all the stories deserve similar kind of uh, factual scrutiny. In fact, um, you know, uh, I will say Kapil and uh, I don't know um, whether what Jayashree's take on this is because I think this is a, I think different genders react differently to it because I've had panelists disagree with me on Hafta. This was our main criticism of the Indian Me Too movement. The Indian Me Too movement achieved jack shit because in the US and other countries, while the first allegation may have been on social media, the subsequent reports were done as reports by reporters who went through a very robust process of writing the report. 
gathering evidence, taking time to push, you know, to figure out five, six things, and then publishing the report. And that led to real life consequences. People were fired, people were imprisoned, you know, people lost their jobs. In India, the Me Too movement had no consequences. And I put the blame squarely on reporters. And I have had disagreements and I've been told I react that because I'm a man with, you know, female uh, colleagues and friends of mine in the same space. Just because an allegation is there on Twitter, reporters just carried it as the truth. And there were at least three cases that I know of that turned out to be fake. That is how Me Too was reporting was done in India. And if anyone is to take the blame for the failure of that movement to, you know, bust anything, it has to be borne by the journalists of this country who reported on Me Too as just copy pasting Twitter allegations. And at that time, they were celebrated. At that time, I thought it, was, it sucked. Today, I say it sucks. Uh, and that is the exact thing of the source. Without anything, they just published a report. And most people did it. Um, anyway, Jeshree, you have a view on that? Uh, so I think the online Me Too movement was a great thing. I think the number of women who are encouraged to come forward with their stories was great. I do also have an issue with how the media reported on it because also I think this is an issue across, I mean, outside of Me Too as well, which is you pick up a story of Twitter and you run it. A story on, on social media is not a story. It is a version of someone's story that you as a journalist before printing it or whatever have to use as a base to then investigate a story. So in that aspect, yes, I do agree that they were just reduced to tweets. Yeah. And that is not a story. So, but I this mean, is true of everything outside me too as well. We, I mean, the, the one story that we did on that, it took us, I think, for two months, two and a half months to do that story. Yeah, and these stories it, should take that much time. All the evidence that we needed, because I mean, it was a story, you know, it was about BCCI. Yeah. yeah. It, and you know, you can't just based on one tweet say, this is it. I mean, we spoke to people, we spoke to about a dozen people. We got evidence that tomorrow, if you know, someone says something. Uh, but, you know, people publish that story just copy paste. Yeah, and for me, this isn't even about whether you believe the allegation or not. Because for me, as a bottom line, I would believe it. But you need to treat that story with respect, right? Like, what is the point of just running a same tweet and saying we're done with it? You need to do the groundwork and make it into something more. So that, yeah, that does. I do agree with you on that part. So on that note, uh, let's get your recommendations and then say goodbye to our listeners. Uh, Jeshi, why don't you tell us your recommendation first? Sure. So my first recommendation is a Tamil movie because I'm very true to my roots. The movie is called Surarai Potru. It's recently released on Amazon Prime and it's loosely based on the story of Captain Gopinath during what I think was a very interesting time in Indian aviation. So since I like recommending companion pieces, my next recommendation is also aviation related. It's a story headlined Collision in the long form journalism website 52. It's the story of a mid-air collision of two aircraft uh, over a village near Delhi in 96. I mean, it doesn't really throw up anything new, but it's really good to see long form writing on aviation air crashes, which is something that you usually read about in foreign publications. And I have a third recommendation because I am so sure there must be subscribers out there who like me are big fans of pandemic literature. Mm. So this is the book, The Last One by Alexander Oliver. It's about people participating in a reality show that do not realize a pandemic is taking place just outside their world. So yeah, great book. Please read it. Thank you, Anand. Just one recommendation, since we talked about Bihar polls, uh, so amid a lot of uh, analytical pieces and analysis that have come uh, out of it, uh, I think uh, the broader signals, the broader signals, uh, because uh, an election does not throw up m many signals uh, because it's uh, restricted in a time frame with, uh, with of five years and it can change. But some broader signals uh, uh, that uh, that have been captured in writings of Sabal Gupta is a social scientist and heads uh, at an organization called the Asian Development Research Institute in Patna, Sabal Gupta. So his writings on Bihar elections of 2020, uh, which are scattered over different newspapers and some uh, journals. He has also given interview to one, two channels. So uh, as a collection of uh, his reflections on these elections, that is uh, my recommendation. They were they are uh, informative as well as insightful. 
Right. Thank you. And my recommendation is this fascinating podcast that I heard. It's called Hacking the Perfect Auction. It's uh, on Planet Money. You have to listen to it. Uh, this is basically spectrum auctions, broadband. So around the 2G auctions that were made of much here. I had no idea how complicated it can be. Of course, here it was not complicated, uh, but there it was complicated because those bandwidths were already sold to local TV stations, which needed to be sold to telecom companies and how they actually achieved that and the kind of leakage that happened and private equity players made a lot of money in that process because they had an inside tip off. Um, it's fascinating for a lot of reasons, for the tech reasons. Uh, and also in America, if something is working, even if a few people made $7 billion in the middle, they don't really care. You know, they, it was not a political issue. If private equity firms made a lot of money in buying things earlier. Uh, but listen to it and uh, let me know what you think. On that note, thank you, dear panel. I shall leave you with this song dedicated to Nitish Kumarji. It is in your local language, at least one of the dialects, I guess, in Bihar. Until next week, have a wonderful Diwali and uh, be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy Diwali. All the News Laundry podcasts are available on Stitcher, iTunes, and any other podcast platform. Please subscribe to News Laundry. Help us keep news independent. To catch all our podcasts on news, pop culture, current affairs, and sport, visit newslaundry.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channel.